uh, who's a big star down in, in Western Kentucky now, but, uh, but uh, this was his first shift. He'd been, a D, he'd been from Illinois and then he'd gone to Chicago and worked for a few years. But anyway, I did afternoon drive the summer of 88 and I enjoyed it. Um, and uh, we gave away tickets, all sorts of concerts. I mean, it was beginning to be the fun part of radio. Um, and because I had sat at home the previous five years and the birth of MTV and watching all these videos, well, then I knew the artists. Um, and it really wasn't from listening to a lot of radio. It was from <laughs> watching MTV. And so um, uh, the summer of 88, I had a big time. But at the same time, you know, I had to be someplace at the same time. I had to work a five-hour shift. Uh, I just told him, I said, I'm not doing any production. And I said, you know, I said, I do want to be promotion manager. So uh, Bruce Willis came to town to film the movie In Country. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, his song, uh, Respect Yourself, his, his uh, redo of the Staple Singer song was on the radio. Yep. And I was on the afternoon drive. Well, they were filming this, uh, this show, uh, the TV show, uh, sorry, it's a movie called In Country. And Bobby Mason, who grew up in Western Kentucky, had wrote the story and was about her brother who had been in Nam. And in Ballard County, not very far away from where I was, uh, you know, the thickets back there looked a lot like the Vietnam, you know, yeah. growth, growth, of all these extra vines hanging from trees and stuff. And so he was down there filming it. But every afternoon between two and three, his housekeeper, uh, he was living in Reedland and his housekeeper would call the request line. OK, Bruce is in the house. Would you play Respect Yourself? And uh, so it was it was so humorous. Um, uh, to know that Bruce Willis, who was not as big a deal as he is now, because he hadn't done that many movies, but I certainly knew who he was really, from, yeah, well, from, moon, him, really, yeah. from Moonlighting. But the crazy part was um, the, there's a concert venue there, and they had it like on three different levels. And yeah. you could be sitting on a table at this level, and then right in front of you at your you know, I, level of the table back here is the back of a booth that's dropped down three feet. And um, my wife at the time, we were sitting there getting her ready to watch the Rascals, uh, Felix Cavalieri and these other people from the, the Young Rascals. Yeah. And um, just as soon as the lights went down, I thought, well, this is crazy. There's a big empty booth just right here at the front. I wonder... You know, why haven't they have come in? It was Bruce and Demi Moore, his wife at the time, and Rumor was born there in Paducah, Kentucky, where <laughs> I was at the time. Um, and, and so, but they had this whole group of people and literally I could have reached out and touched Bruce or Demi. They were, they were right below us. Wow. Um, and the crazy part was um, the young rascals are from New York. And Felix Cavallari was up there, whatever. But I think there was one of the other people that, that, that Bruce knew because he had grown up in New York. And, of course, yeah. they were New Yorkers, so they knew who he was. Well, they didn't know he was in town filming a movie. And at the end of uh, or one of the songs or something, he walked over to the edge and came over to the bottom of the stage and waved. And they all just stopped. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Let's walk on Bruce, <laughs> Bruce Willis. <laughs> and this guy was just like beside himself because the last thing, you know, you're from New York, you know, you know Bruce Willis, but you're never going to run into Bruce Willis on the road. Right, right, right. And yeah. sure, Bruce comes up and waves and whatever. So um, this was, and, and Bruce was, uh, Bruce, Demi was very pregnant with rumor. Literally, I mean, like eight or nine months. I think the next week she had rumor mm -hmm. there in Western Kentucky. So I've been lucky to, to find, but the, 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 the more frequent pictures that you find at the takeyouback.com are the meet and greet pictures. Um, I had saved money. My dad had passed and left me some money, um, left all of the siblings, and, and we all split it up. But, but I knew I wanted to do a meet and greet from my favorite group. Uh, I remember WLS and CFL playing the very beginnings in the Chicago and make me smile was probably my favorite. And then, uh, but the long cut of beginnings, I mean, just everything about Chicago was a plus, except of course they'd gone through several changes and, yeah, and, uh, changes and Terry, like, like believe it. 
Yeah, and Terry Kath, of course, passing away, and then Danny Serafin, the original drummer, and being a drummer, uh, the, you know, he was one of my heroes. He was one of those people I listened to the headphones with the early Chicago, that first uh, double album, and uh, and that the dumb, the drum stuff in Make Me Smile was, I mean, I was just yeah. like, wow. Yeah. Well, it, it gets crazy here because Danny, of course, got kicked out of the group for doing drugs and stuff, and he got cleaned up and everything, but he started a group. So one night I went to see Chicago and um, Tris Embodden, who I think you just recently yeah. interviewed. Ladies Absolutely. and gentlemen, the next interview will be Tris Embodden. Yeah, so, um, but uh, uh, it was one of those crazy, crazy times. And I went um, to, the, to, uh, to Chicago that night, but I'd already bought tickets to see Danny Serafin and his band was California Transit Authority or CTA, oh, nice. which was the, which was the yeah. same initials as, yeah. as CTA, Chicago Transit Authority. And he played at Suncoast, which is another uh, one of the eight or nine casinos that sort of ring Vegas. And I, I made some friends and, and uh, went to see Chicago and then went the next night to see Danny. And these these friends had had befriended Danny when he was here and said, look, we'll help sell your merchandise. So when the show is over, I'm standing there behind the table while he's signing the books and records and I'm handing him the next book or the next picture or Patty's handing me one. So it was an interesting uh, opportunity uh, to meet Danny. Mm -hmm. And then I met his son and a couple of other siblings were there and they had come in. A couple of them lived here, lived here in Vegas, but, uh, but it, was, it was an interesting opportunity um, <laughs> because of some of the other people I knew here and just one little introduction led to another one. And uh, some of them I could do interviews with my iPhone and, and, and you know, uh, but I didn't really necessarily, I knew who Danny was, to me he was a hero, but if I played, you know, this is Danny Serafin, you're listening to Kurt David on Taking You Back, half the people go like, who's Danny Serafin? <laughs> you know, so I tried to cut back on that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, to me it was, I, I didn't need it for an ego boost. Let's put it that way. I understand. I have a question for you. That'll be, I guess yes. I know um, the, the, I love the way, you know, you just keep talking. That's great. I love that. <laughs> uh, you're a great interview, by the way. That's a great Thank interview. You. And Thank I you. try to give you enough time to talk. But the question I have is for you is compared to the fifties, the sixties, seventies and eighties. Now I know you draw the line after the eighties, but I didn't even like other songs in the nineties. Um, what was your favorite era of music or does each, era represents something different for you because it does for me i like the 50s because it beyond and all the other music i like the 60s i like some 40s too um but i like the 60s for you know a lot of the the the, the love and then also the great great songs and the songwriting from simon and garfunkel and then of course the 70s with great songwriters like harry chapin and and even some from the 60s into the 70s and of course the 80s had its own um, love ballads, oh, yeah. you know, Arios. I mean, all them different eras mean something to me. What do they mean to you? Well, you have heard my show. I just want you to tell my listeners. I know it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, the three, the th I, I do, I do pure sixties. I do pure seventies. I do some shows that overlap those, and then the eighties is pure eighties. I never was on the radio in the nineties. I the nineties to me was where the world changed okay. musically mm -hmm. and. Um, but, but yeah, I, I connected to a lot of the show's songs, uh, that I saw on MTV in the eighties. And so I would be much more, uh, missing you from John Waite. You know, it was a song that connected to me from when I'd gotten divorced and I dated a girl and then we broke up and I was missing her. Uh, you know, there was no difference in being a DJ. I still was connected to the songs the same way every right. listener it has been through all these different years. Um, I remember wanting to go visit this girl uh, in in uh, Moorhead, Kentucky, and I wanted to take her um, a Christmas present. And I walked up and down her street, and I just couldn't get up the nerve. But it was the Wichita Lineman song from oh, Glenn Campbell that just true. tore me tore me up. Yeah, and still does. Uh, so I'm no different than any other listener, you know, just because I play them um, and I'm knowledgeable about them. I have my favorites. Um, and that was, I guess, what brought Taking You Back to the Forefront 
was I wanted to, I did these class reunions uh, with my own class and I would bring things and everybody wanted CDs. So I had to ship some copies of CDs back so that they could listen to them. They were driving around in their cars and it never even really crossed my mind until um, a couple of people, I passed them out and a couple of radio guys got a hold of them and like, well, Kurt, how many of these got? And I said, well, six or seven. Well, when you get 20 or so back, you know, made, bring them over here and we'll put them on the air every weekend. That's and that, that's, that's actually how taking you back. And, and then I had this friend that had planted the seed. He said, well, you're going to have to have a name and, you know, what you're going to do on themes. Yeah. And I said, I said, well, I said, I'd just like to take this hour and talk about the British invasion and play but it was it wasn't the Beatles and the Stones. It was uh, this is welcome to Kurt David and taking you back and my British invasion show. You won't hear any Beatles. You won't hear any Stones, but you'll hear Jerry and the Pacemakers. And, yeah. and in other words, I wanted to play or I said minus the Beatles and Stones. And um, they got all the airplay, but there were so many other great songs. Yeah, and so I totally was, agree. Totally agree. It, I, yeah, it, I, I mean, even the bands that we don't know over here. Well, mm -hmm. over there got more airplay because of over there, but because of our, I don't know, structure of mm -hmm. radio, we mm -hmm. were only allowed to hear the Beatles right. and Stones. And right. that's the part that what I tried to do when I got into radio here was change that, just like yes. you did. Yes, so, yes. A lot, a, lot of it, a lot of it is aligned to what you do. Well, and I think that that was what I found and the beauty of what turned out to be initially, and in some ways it still is, I'm on a, a ton of different internet stations, awesome. but I'm also, I, I worry more about the one radio station or the, actually I'm on two different radio stations still back in Western Kentucky. And I have to, uh, when I'm making a new show, um, then I think about, well, I need to include this song or I maybe need to leave this one out and I'll put that in an internet version show because it was never really a big radio hit. Um, ironically, I was just going to say the, uh, the, the list I made the other day was the artist that I've seen since I moved to Vegas and it's Chicago and earth, wind and fire and the righteous brothers, the pictures I just showed you. Awesome. Uh, awesome. And, and so my next new th 333rd or whatever, whatever the number is, the next new show that I be put, am going to be putting together and offing offering to stations like yours and others around the country, uh, around the world, actually, um, it will be, you know, Chicago and then Earth, Wind and Fire and the Righteous Brothers in, in order, uh, went to see a share. Uh, she was fabulous. I didn't buy, I didn't buy a seat real close, but you know, when she comes back to town and, and, uh, if I want to, I will buy, I will, I will call early enough or I will go online the minute the, you know, the, the seats are available or I will call, join the fan club. And that's the other thing. I ended up joining all these fan clubs because the fan clubs get first shot at a meet and greet. So if you really want to go back and meet Cher or you want to meet the members of Chicago or you want to meet these groups, not all of them offer it, but, but it's really through the fan clubs. Yeah. You know, that's funny too, because, um, we went to a Happy Together tour. It was last year, pre-COVID, me and my yes. wife. Um, yes. and, uh, and you know, everybody was on there, you know, uh, Chuck yeah, Nagel. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, Susan Castle still looks amazing for yes. her age. Uh, uh, Gary Puckett still looks amazing for his age. Mm -hmm. um, the Buckingham. Uh, there's so many great bands, the Grassroots. I mean, so many different bands. But anyway, we got to meet all of them, and I got a picture. But the thing was, it was my anniversary the next day. So I took my wife there for anniversary. I did not know, but I did know Godfrey Townsend from Alan Parsons Project when he played on the albums. And me and mm -hmm. him were friends for years. And he's also an independent artist. So I've been playing his music. So Good. I got to meet him. And then I, then I found out that they were doing a picture with everybody. I said, you know what? I'd like to get that picture because it's something to remember. I didn't have a way of getting in. So what happened was when I found one of the guys and I said, listen, I said, me and my wife's anniversary tomorrow. Do you think I can get a picture? I said, oh, sure. Go ahead. Go over there. I don't care. But they're taking the fan club VIP things. So right. the guy gave me his ticket. And mm -hmm. he said, listen, he said, I don't know if it's going to work, but it might. 
The guy never said nothing. It looked at the ticket. He saw the same numbers, but he knew that we were there for a special reason. And sure. we got that picture. That was the most, I can't tell you, that was the blessed night that we ever had. Mm -hmm. uh, taking hands mm -hmm. with Ron Dante, right, uh, right, you know, right. and Gary Puckett. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, oh my God, everybody was there. And it was just a magical moment for me. Um, wow. Bob Castle was there, I, th I think. Was Bob? He didn't die, right? Bob didn't die. I'm not sure which one did. Yeah, one of them that, that did die was, you know, of course. But Susan and her brother was there. And mm -hmm. uh, the guys from the, the Turtles, except uh, the Flo and Eddie? Guy. Yeah, Flo was there. The one with okay. the hair. Yeah, she was there. Yeah. He was there. Uh, but that's, I mean, that was a night that, listen, when, when you listen to that music, the 60s, it, it makes okay. you, like you said, anything happy, happy together, it makes you feel so good. Oh, yeah. You know? And that music well, that you play and the music that I play and the music that was there that night, you could see the audience. There was, you went from kids to yeah. seniors and everybody in between. And we all loved the music. You know, well, we my, all loved it. Yeah, my two younger daughters, I have, uh, I think one is 43 and one is 30. They're 13 years apart. Um, but they are music fiends because they grew up with it from yeah, their it. Cri the crib on and they will you know save their money to go do a meet and greet um now my daughter uh corey um oh, oh def leopard she she and her girlfriend are just def leopard fiends and have been backstage and met the group like 15 times well, i don't even want to know what they paid but it doesn't matter they're like me i, I won't go out to eat or i won't go to a sh to these four shows I'll save that thousand dollars or that five hundred dollars and I will buy a meet and greet because I want to meet that person and I want that picture with them so um, and again sort of because I'm in the business and you're in the business most cases we can deduct those ticket prices as, as a, bus yeah. as a yeah. business expense because that knowledge that interview that music we use it we use it on, on our products and uh, and that has been good so that is the biggest thing I miss in Vegas. I've always enjoyed going to shows. Um, my dad was the orchestra director. And so even when they would do musicals like West Side Story and South Pacific, dad was down there directing the pit orchestra. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And because, because we only had the one turntable and set of speakers, I can sing every song from West Side Story, South Pacific, Music <laughs> Man. And in fact, I sat here the other night, the Music Man was on. I sat here and watched the whole thing and just sang with it. I love that. Um, well, it, 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 again, most people don't have your parents having to learn the score from Music Man <laughs> or South Pacific. <coughs> As kids, <clears throat> we enjoyed the shows, right. but this was, this was a throwback. Um, and ironically, my dad, later on, we had the albums, but later on when the CDs came out and I got him a CD player, I bought him South Pacific and Music Man and West Side oh, Story. Okay. And so guess what I listened to? And I, we lost him a couple of years ago before I drove out here. Mm -hmm. And but, but when I drove out here, I'm singing, Marion, the librarian, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm playing the, the songs that, that oh, is a so kid as a kid in elementary school and later in junior high, um, you know, I was going to the college and dad was with the college kids and they were putting on these, these musicals that were only five or six, maybe 10 years out from <clears throat> when they were introduced to the public on Broadway. Um, and that, that was interestingly funny and, and uh, a part of my life that, that if you didn't grow up in that world and you don't relate to those songs, then you, and I'm I'm a weirdo. <laughs> oh, and I and I here's the thing. I do relate to them songs. I, I, mm -hmm. I the other night I was watching the what was it singing in the rain, and I yeah. it's like the first time I saw it again. You know, right. with Gene Kelly. I mean, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. I still mm -hmm. love the show, and I know every aspect of it. Every part where Donald O'Connor goes up and dances on the wall and comes <laughs> on and right. I mean, you know, everything about it. But anyway, I wanted to ask you. Um, as a DJ, as an oldies DJ, as a music DJ, if you had to do anything in your life, would you ever change from, if you had a chance to not be a DJ, what would you have wanted to do? That's a question that a lot of people always ask me. And I said, well, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to be uh, a computer guy and get into mm -hmm. computers years ago. But 
because of my situation with things and sports and um, other issues that I had with, you know, just dealing with life. Um, I didn't. So I went a different route. I became an automotive technician with the New Jersey State Police. So right. and then I did the radio on the side and I became the radio guy for everybody that knew that wanted to know music and oh, what's the name of that song? What's who yeah. that song? You know, and then and then you you know, okay. And then I had my mini stroke, and of course I got a little knowledge, but I lost a lot of information I used to have where what right. was the name of the the the, the uh, 45, how long was it, who wrote it? Right. Uh, and there's so much into it, you know, and then we were talking too about, um, and um, I'll let you answer, um, to Tris about, you know, the unknown artist, unknown artist on the record. Uh, people know the band, but they don't know who's in the band. A lot of them don't know who's in the band or right. if they go out on their own, they don't know who they are. So that's kind of like a shield for them and kind of unfamous because I mm-hmm. think it happened to um, the guy from um, Boston. Uh, because nobody knew who he was. I'm right. not talking about Tom Schultz. I'm talking about the other guy, um, not oh. Brad, um, but the guitarist. Uh, I think his name was Barry. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But anyway, mm-hmm. I, you know who I'm talking about. And um, it's it's a uh, fame is a is a fleeting thing. You know, you either you, you get up there or you don't, and um, and you want it or you don't want it. I mean, when you're there, you, you're mm-hmm. loving it. But then when you start dropping off, people don't know who you are anymore. And then it's a fleeting thing. Well, it's funny. I met a tech guy <clears throat> when I worked at the, <clears throat> excuse me, NBC TV station, Rodney. And this guy could just, you know, you give him a bale of hay and, and a motor and he could make a car. I mean, he was just, just, he still is. Um, long story short, over time, he became my webmaster. Mm-hmm. And he, he created the takeyouback.com. And he puts all the whistles and bells and different things. I send him pictures or things. Um, And he became a fan of Gary Puckett. And so he put together, and he thought Gary Puckett's Puckett's website just sucked. So he put together a Gary Puckett website and sent a note over to Gary Puckett. He didn't know him from Adam. And and, uh, I think he might've used mine and a few other websites that he had created as references and Gary Puckett hired him, and he's still doing his website today. Nice, very nice. So you know you can you can back your way into the to the, the this world. Um, you know, uh, just because I live in Vegas, I know that uh, there are several acts that t- tour around the country that actually live outside Vegas. Uh, they can go see other shows, great restaurants, uh, go great theatrical plays and musicals here. I mean, it is, is a, a, a big city and, and the benefits that go with it. I live in a condo seven miles off the strip. Um, oh, nice. It's, it's uh, everybody else who lives here is over 65. It's gated. Um, there's not, you know, what few kids are running around. Uh, they're visiting grandparents. I mean, you know, we, we all have been in that situation, but it is, is something that because I record audio like yourself, mm-hmm. I need to have some control. And um, so, like I said, I've, I've, this is a carpeted den with this big quilt on the wall and I bought extra heavy curtains that I hung. So um, I wouldn't say it's totally super quiet. There's a jet going over right now, um, <laughs> which is not a surprise for, for the number of people that come into Vegas. Uh, I'm on one of the not strong glide paths, but, uh, but I, I, I have to stop from time to time and, and wait. Or if there's a delivery truck outside delivering something or moving somebody in next door, it's like mm-hmm. everything else. I can't control it, but I don't have to um, 24-7. And um, uh, it's enjoyable. But this is the, the – the, the, I don't know what your situation is, but um, I ended up uh, – getting divorced in um, 2012 and um, my lady worked for a bank. She went to work at eight, came home at five and she couldn't figure out why I couldn't go get that same kind of job. (laughs) And that's, that's, and no interest in music, no interest in songs. I mean, it was, you know, we fell in love for other reasons and had a baby girl and raised her. Um, But it's one of those kind of situations that, um, um, you know, this just goes with the territory. As you said, you mentioned being a mechanic. Mm -hmm. Uh, That might be somebody, something that some lady is 
uh, grew up uh, taking engines apart or or whatever to where she can relate to do what you do and and you know i'm fine with that i have uh, uh, two ex-wives and two beautiful or well, beautiful daughter from each That's one uh, the first wife and i are super friends we met and, and in fact she worked at that campus radio station um and i knew the secretary and i don't know how many months after i was there working part-time um, as a freshman in college. And I said, well, who's that lady who just left? She said, well, that's Cindy Blanton. And I said, well, does she work here? And she said, well, she types the logs that we have to have. And there's a page for each hour. And we're on the air from 6 a.m. to midnight. So it's 18 hours. So she has to type the legal stuff. And you know, when yeah. you're back there, you have to sign the log for each hour. Lot, so yeah. if anything happens and there's a question, the FCC knows exactly who was on the air and who was responsible for went on the air during that hour. But, and that was her work study. I ended up getting a work study at the radio station. So they paid me to come in and run some of the NPR so, shows and, and some of the real, real things. But, uh, but anyway, I ended up meeting her and that this was her work study. And, um, but, uh, but uh, we ended up uh, meeting more the next year when I was at a college and, and uh, do we both just like each other and enjoyed our, our company? But eventually then, you know, push came to shove and I went a different direction. And, and uh, but we have a, a beautiful daughter who's also a teacher as her mama was back in Kentucky and uh, the proud uh, um, mother of my two grandsons. And uh, so that's, that's my downside on being this far away, but I stayed in Kentucky for 43 years didn't leave, didn't go find other things, but the, the internet introduced me to the opportunity to make these shows. And my friend Joel, who's passed away, was the one who taught me about MP3 and FTP and suggested, because he had an internet radio station and a friend in Louisville, and he said, uh, you know, let me teach you how you can put these out here and just give people the username and password. They can pull them down and put them on their shows. And and that's that's how... Um, the exposure, um, and uh, I mean, I got a guy in Hong Kong and uh, Australia that they just have super powerful radio stations outside the United States. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll go 500 miles and, you know, not bat an eyelash. And uh, so that has been interesting and getting just inter emails from people around the world. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you came from, but we enjoy your show here in in Leon, France, you know, I mean, it's you know, you just, know, it's funny, you know, it's funny, though, Kurt, when you say that, I mean, listen, you've got a great show, right? I mean, it, <laughs> technically, you should be able to get any advertiser you want. Well, let me let me stop you there and, and, and pick up from there. That is the reason I'm Las Vegas. And I had Dick Clark came to Kentucky, picked him up at the airport, spent 12 hours with him. I brought him to the stage at uh, the two o'clock show. Um, then, and when it was over, we went to eat with uh, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas and Gary U.S. Bonds. And nice. I can't think through who the other act was and the owner of the venue and uh, our radio station sponsored it and was representing the station. Then I brought him to the stage at seven o'clock and uh, I'll send you the scribbled up note that, that his manager, Larry, handed me um, because I still have it. And uh, I scanned it in the other day and... Uh, um, and this was the note that they, you know, this is Kurt Engelhart, welcome, or Kurt David, you know, welcome on behalf of this radio station. We're glad you're here. And then I had to read this liner thing that then brought them to the stage. But, but I, you know, I hung on to all this stuff and, the, and, and these kinds of things are what sort of trigger ideas for me to make a new show. And uh, so one of the shows that I planned to do was, okay, I went to see Chicago. And then the night, next night, I or within a couple of days, I went to see Earth, Wind, and Fire. And then Righteous Brothers and three, uh, Chuck Negron from Three Dog Night. Right. And so I'm getting ready to make a sh one of the future Taking You Back shows that, you know, here's a trip down my uh, memory lane when I first got to Vegas and the acts I went to see in the order I went to see them. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm, I did go see Dennis DeYoung um, as a solo thing, and he was very good. I didn't do a meet, meet or greet or anything. I just found out about it at the last time and went over and bought a ticket and walked in and, and enjoyed the show. But uh, 
Um, uh, that, that's, you know, C-19 is, is, is um, allowing me to watch a whole lot more NBA basketball and, and, and clean my condo a little more often and, you know, do some things because I would normally be out spending money uh, to going to see all these different artists that rotate through Vegas. But, uh, but if I don't see any more, I've seen plenty and um, I enjoy the weather. I enjoy, uh, you know, I don't have snow and ice and all of the things that oh, I've had yeah. <laughs> growing up. So, um, oh, and, geez, I don't miss that. Believe me, I don't miss that. Oh, yeah. God. And, and, um, it back to, you know, I'm hoping that, uh, that over time, uh, my one daughter, Victoria, was here and we hung out and did some things. And she has moved to Maui and she teaches mindfulness. And I'm hoping. The other daughter will have a, a teacher's meeting or something out here, a conclave of some kind uh, to where she will, she will have a chance to come out here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, if I, I'm, I'm enjoying being able to rerun what I've spent 15 years building, but I don't want to stop. I want to continue to have, um, make new shows, but by having this many shows, then the rotation really pushes them out. Um, and, but the whole purpose of moving from Kentucky, even with all the internet stations, was to go to LA and make a pitch to um, Dick Clark's friend uh, who came to Kentucky with him. I spent 12 hours with these guys, picked them up at the airport, and I had to have them back to fly out at the nine o'clock flight. And then, then Shortly after that, of course, the Dick started doing the blooper show, and I had moved to the NBC okay. station. And so I started sending them bloopers of my friend Keith messing up in the news department, and they would run those. And he caught me, he was here several years ago, several months ago, but he called me and said, well, I don't think I ever told you, Kurt, but every time you sent a blooper and they ran it on NBC, they sent me a check for 50 bucks. <laughs> and they didn't send me anything, of course. I mean, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> so, well, that was fine. I, I oh, was thrilled. God thrilled that he got on tv and um and uh, his his son lives in la so they they drove across country and stopped and spent a couple of days in vegas with me but um i am uh larry, of course dick clark has passed away but the guy that came with him larry klein uh, basically is one of the head people at dick clark productions and just as c19 started i had just sent off a thumb drive to larry hey i'm in vegas um and and when i went to the tv station I would get these blooper tapes and I would send them to Larry. So even though I didn't have a lot of in, uh, continual in, uh, involvement with Dick, that he was the host of the bloopers, one of the producers, and so was Larry. And so I am still hoping to pitch my Taking You Back shows and the 300 that are produced um, and are in Pro Tools and Final Cut and, and you know, they're where I can go mm -hmm. back and make make changes and uh, they're professionally done at the highest level um, that you would do at a recording studio in LA or New York or Chicago mm -hmm. um, because I invested in that equipment and I am that picky about the quality as you can sure. tell Absolutely. from airing the show. So I am still hopeful that at some point in time I will have the opportunity to present to someone who will at least take the time to listen to some of the scoped uh, taking you back shows songwriters search shows to me uh, i get more comments about those um and i have enough of those i could that could actually be a four weeks taking you back and uh you know and then you know every you know the the fifth sunday of every you know quarter then you know we run songwriter searches that week and uh, so i'm i'm still hopeful and and the, the purpose of that was uh, I was living in Kevel, Kentucky, and then I was in Ledbetter, Kentucky. And neither one of those, you know, if I was to get on with Dick Clark or Casey Kasem's company, both of them are passed away, right. but someone right. is continuing to run their shows. They both do countdown shows. To me, a countdown show in the 70s, which was when they were originally produced and great, Right. But there are, there are songs that you and I have played on radio stations that never really made it. But they're still in these damn Dick Clark countdowns and they don't edit them out. So here's Dick playing a song for three and a half minutes that was never a hit, was right. never heard. Right. And I'm like, could you at least edit those things out? You know what I mean? <laughs> to me, you know, I don't mind them playing the hits, but there were other ones, you know, whatever was on the chart is what they played. 
I know. And some of the things that made the chart, of course, never made it. But I, I'm still hoping, and, and the purpose was that way if, if, let's say, a syndication company says, you know, okay, we like this guy. Let's pitch him to our top 10 stations that we already have a show on. We already have a rapport with them. Let's, they're running the Dick Clark or they're running the Casey Kasem. These are of the same genre. Or we can go to these 80s radio stations and pitch, pitch this guy. And the idea would be that, Where's, he, where's this guy from? I like him and I like his shows, but where's he based out of? Oh, he's based out of Vegas. Oh, okay. My, my reputation just went up because of where I'm living. Credibility. Um, all credibility. Yeah, absolutely. I totally yeah. agree with you. No, I, it, it, the, thing, the thing you're saying is absolutely true, but I just want to say, we, were, we talked to Eddie Money. We interviewed Eddie Money and we yeah. um, actually had a meet and greet a couple of years ago before he passed away, of course. Yeah. Um, and he told me, he said the first album that he did he said he had about three hits on there that he wanted to come out, but the radio, not the radio station, but the, the, the people Record. that produced the album yeah. wouldn't allow it. They only wanted Baby Hold On and maybe Two Tickets to Paradise. Right. They wouldn't allow the third song or another couple songs that he wrote, you know, of course, on the album. And right. he was really upset about it because he was thinking mm -hmm. about like, what is this? I could add four or five hits and I've only got one major hit. And of course, Two Tickets to Paradise was the, the second one. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's just, I mean, if you look in retrospect, the people that pull the strings, all right, they're not always in your best interest. True. Um, true. I mean, you, you'd like to think they are, but mm -hmm. they're also just like, uh, I don't know if you know the story about Don Arden and David Arden with the ELO. When, mm -hmm. when David Arden was controlling ELO or the monkeys, when David Arden was controlling the monkeys, he told, uh, he told all the monkeys, of course, you just sit there and look pretty and I'll let Boyce and Hart play. I'll let, you know, everybody else yeah. fill in the, 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 the cutting, the crew was there, you know, the crew that, mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. okay, the bass player. Yes. I mean, the wrecking crew, they were the ones that helped make the hits. Like I'm a believer. And sure. it, they all had a fallout because of that, because David Arden said, yeah, I will produce hits for you but I don't want you guys to play. Now, everybody couldn't, but you know the whole story about well, how someone could, yeah. could and Mike yeah. Nesmith could a little bit. David, not too much. Mickey, not so much, but um, they all could do a part. You know, uh -huh. they didn't want to do anything. I just want to look pretty and be show people. That's it. And that was kind of the fallout that they had with mm -hmm. David Arden. In fact, I think uh, uh, I'm going to actually be talking to Christian and Nesmith, uh, which is Mike Nesmith's son, in, yeah. in soon. I don't know, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months or whatever. But I'm going to ask him that question. Your dad had to deal with, you know, almost punching David Arden out uh, mm -hmm. because of the situation they had with Arden Productions. Of course, Don Kirshner was involved in that too. Right. Don Kirshner's rock concert. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of people pulling the strings. And at the same time, again, it's not always in your best interest. You may think it is. And uh, as far as you would advertising – Oh my God, geez, listen, you're on how many radio stations? You, you know, the, their advertising could go, you know, literally through the roof. And here well, they're not taking the opportunity to do it. I don't understand yeah. people. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. If we're on a broadcast station, then one set of rules apply to the commercials. Um, and, and what is that? But, because I allow everything to be played. Well, what I'm saying is the broadcast stations, let me say it this way. There are certain commercials or certain songs and things you can't play on the internet. Um, not so much the songs as it is. You mean family um, friendly or are you talking about family friendly music? Well, not necessarily, but literally there are certain songs, I'm sorry, commercials that are not licensed for the internet. They are licensed for broadcast only. I understand. And that. so if you get into some gray areas. And my problem was I'm creating the shows. I'm selling my local commercials right. there in Western Kentucky. I'm still doing that. I still have clients back there um, that I was going to say, send me checks every month, but I haven't got checks <laughs> in three months because yeah. they're, they're bookkeeping and office people. One's a bank. And nobody's going to the bank, so they're not cutting me checks. And 
I just, okay, this is C-19, Kurt. You're just going to have to, to uh, not count on that money coming in. Right. But they have been sponsors since I started on the air 15 years ago or 16 years ago there on the broadcast stations. Um, so it was sort of a, I made them for the internet stations and then the broadcast thing started and people would call me with ideas that I knew or I'd run into somebody, hey, you ought to do a British invasion. And I said, well, I've already done it. And, I, and he said, no, I mean, minus the Beatles and Stones. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, Gary and the Pacemakers. I mean, you know, you just go through this whole laundry list of other people who were part of the British invasion when you lop off the Stones and the Beatles and the, the major acts. There's so many great songs. Ferry Cross the Mersey is my favorite British invasion it song. Is. Great song. I mean, so again, and this is, this goes back to when I'm 16, 17, 18 years old, um, even before then, actually, when I was 12 or 13 and uh, in Boston would have been British invasion time. And, and of course I was a huge Beatles fan and it was, it was wonderful to be able to actually go see Paul McCartney here. Now I, I didn't pay through the nose and buy a thousand dollar seat. I didn't do a meet and greet. I doubt he did a meet and greet. But just the fact that I can say, yes, I saw one of the Beatles live. I sat through a concert. Um, Ringo was here, and I'm hoping that he'll come back um, just because I was a drummer. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously John and George are gone. Um, but uh, you just saw the big Beatles poster hanging there. And my yeah. dad bought, my dad bought me that when we were in, in – uh, Belmont, Massachusetts. And the crazy part was, you know, it was just a rolled up poster. It wasn't in a frame or mounted or anything. Right. And there were, there were two girls a year or two younger than me. And I was in junior high and uh, 65, I think this was. And I would walk down the street to say hi to them. And I had the poster and I'd unroll the poster and they'd jump up <laughs> and down and scream. And then when I roll the poster back up, they'd stop. And I had never, ever experienced that in my <laughs> yeah. life. And, and that was a good time for me to go, hmm, maybe this rock and roll gig won't be such a bad, <laughs> a bad thing to do. Oh, that's and funny. Yeah. So, you know, this, this goes back to where I appreciate people like yourself who have enough <laughs> history that you can relate to the stories that I'm telling. And I'd like to think, if I dropped off the planet tomorrow or I got a contract with, with Larry or one of these syndication companies mm -hmm. and I didn't live more than a year or two, they've got, you know, 300 shows. They can keep Kurt David alive. And I, just like Casey Kasem, the shows are still played here. The Dick Clark shows are still played here. Right. Um, if you're not old enough to remember that they passed away, um, you, oh, I, I mean, Dick's such a great guy. I love listening to him every weekend, you know, and, um, and if I never get on the syndication role and I never, it doesn't matter. I've created the shows. I've enjoyed making them when they play back. I probably have more fans through the internet stations and, and the, some broadcast stations sure. that, that are connected to it. Um, not enough that they're sending me checks, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, and I haven't bumped into anybody here in Vegas who's heard of me before. Um, but I'm sure that somewhere out there, there's somebody that does listen to Take You Back and uh, will go to the website and, you know, maybe see that, you know, oh, here's Kurt Harrison Vegas. I need to send him an email. You know, I live just down the street. So um, it is what it is. I'm 60. I'll be 68 next month. And I went vegan three years ago. I feel good. I, my health is perfect. So I am hoping that I can continue when the C-19 th thing does settle down to reach out to Larry, who I've been again in touch with for, for since 78 when he came with Dick. And um, I think if I can get past the gatekeepers to him, that he will go, you know, it's a thumb drive. I mean, I said, there's, 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 there's 50 taking your back shows on it. Just put me in your car and tell me in two weeks you don't like my stuff. You know, uh, just, you know, you don't have to put in your office and have 12 people come in and listen and get their opinions. You'll, you'll know that I know what I'm doing. And, um, you know, whether it takes it to the next level is in God's hands. And it's not a requirement for me to consider success or failure. 
uh, the fact that you're interviewing me is just a blow away because I would have, you know, I don't think about people realizing that there is a person behind that voice and that there is all this 40 years of history that, that gave me this information and exposed me to all these different acts. Uh, I, was, I was so blown away. I was watching Barry, Robin, and, Bear, uh, and, and uh, Maurice on stage and Maurice is playing this upright bass and the whole gym is full. The Bee Gees were a big deal back in the, even in the, the, the se early seventies. Yep. And um, Maurice says, well, I have to be real careful with this bass. I just want everybody to know, Mr. Engelhardt said he would have my hide if it came back with any dents or anything broken, you know? And that means Robin, <laughs> Robin Gibb knows who my father is. He doesn't. Know, I don't care if he knows who I am. But uh, and I just the fact, the fact that Robin Gibb would be talking about my father on stage and naming Doug Engelhart, um, you know, <laughs> as a college student, just and then nobody sitting around me knew who I was. So it wasn't like twelve people. Kurt, he's talking about your dad. Oh, that's um, awesome. That's but awesome. It's one of those one of those memories. Um, and I remember you were talking about first acts. I um, ended up with a journalism minor, or actually second major. And one of the things that allowed me to do was go backstage and interview the acts. And the, this opening act was on the stage and I was standing back there by the, by the back door and then the main act was getting ready to come on and, uh, or, or was, should have been arriving to, to get ready to get go on. Um, and the door opened and this guy with this guitar mock walked through and he introduced him. So, well, hi, how are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm Kurt Engelhardt. I'm with the campus radio station and the paper. And I wanted to just say hello. And uh, if we get a chance, maybe do a brief interview. He said, well, I'm Mac Davis and you know, we'll do that, Kurt. That's great. I'm glad to see you. And so we, we did the proverbial interview and that was the first artist that I ever met. You talk about the nicest guy. Yeah. yeah. And later on, I obviously, did more history on Mac and where he came from and uh, been to the studios where he recorded in Nashville. And, um, and that was the beauty. I was three hours from Nashville. And so I would go down there later on and um, went in and met several producers and people. And uh, then one of the guys from Paducah got hired as the second engineer at Ronnie Millsap studio. Oh, nice. And we, we were working with some artists that wanted to be, um, become artist, and uh, there was a money guy who was a multimillionaire, and he said, "How much you need?" And George says, ten thousand. So we rented Ronnie Millsap studio and brought in all these musicians, and um, Kathy Harper recorded, and you and I have never heard of her since. But uh, <laughs> you know, that's you know that's one of those that's, opportunities. That's, that's the music business. That's kind of where we're at right now too. But I just mm -hmm. want to digress for a little bit, and then we'll get back yeah. to some stuff. Um, to relate what you're saying is uh, definitely I understand uh, uh, about the, the music industry. I mean, uh, I played trumpet for 14 and a half years and then wow. I played sports and I didn't know which way to go. I was with the local bands and um, I wanted to actually start a band like Chicago. That's how much I loved them back then. Right. And, um, and I just couldn't find the right guys to. But what I did was um, played in a local school band. And one of my friends that lived next door to me, he had a relative i think his aunt lived in california and he always the guy used to kid me all the time he used to say you know hey come to the tonight show you know i'm i'm on the tonight show i play tenor sax i'm like yeah i don't you know i'm a kid i'm a teenager yeah. i didn't believe anything he said so yeah. he said you know you are good enough for the tonight show band and i said really he said yeah you're good enough and you're telling a teenager this and and kurt to be honest with you i i felt so um excited but i knew my mom and dad wanted me to go to california and sure. i was still doing school and plus you know sports and stuff so it wouldn't work but anyway as he was telling me this i'm like yeah i don't believe it you know okay thanks great thank you and then i get home after a baseball game and i get home at night and i see him on the tonight show band playing tenor sax his name was lanny yeah. and i'm like are you freaking kidding me he offered me to be on the Tonight Show band with him, Ed Shaughnessy, Doc Severinsen, and all the people in the band. And now, I said, no, 
What was this guy's name? His Lenny? name was Lanny. I don't I don't remember his last okay. name. I got I got a uh, but he's on I'll if I find a YouTube video of him, I'll Yeah. He had a beard yeah. and he played the alto or tenor sax and he was mm -hmm. an amazing guy, but he saw me play at a high school or a either a junior high or high school um, mm -hmm. band thing. And mm -hmm. he thought I was not not the best trumpet player, but the loudest trumpet player. Cuz remember I don't <laughs> smoke and I don't drink. And he said at right. least all your all your notes were on key and all your notes were pitch perfect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's not so much the high sounds like Maynard Ferguson or Al, you know, Al, whoever. But it, the thing is, the sound quality was there. Right. I know when right. to mute. I knew not when to mute. I, and like I said, 14 and a half years, you hone your craft when you do that, you know, yes. and you start playing really, really well. And I did a lot of mm -hmm. blood, sweat and tears, a lot of Chicago, a lot of Lighthouse. Back then, Lighthouse was big. Because of love my it. morning and a lot yeah. of these other songs, but I mean, they were on in my house every day. I mean, I knew Chicago from the Chicago first album, Chicago Transit mm -hmm. Authority, all the way through to, you know, at that time probably Chicago hits, and then a little further up to maybe uh, Chicago Ten. Right. Um, but all them, all them songs, even after Terry Cat died, mm -hmm. I just wanted to put that together and i think that if i ever achieved that i would have done what my friends are doing now leonid and friends who I, when i talked to tris he said he actually sat in with them and he said they're an amazing russian band that sounds yes. just like chicago they're great yeah. guys too by the way you can't understand what they yeah. say but they're great they sound like they're just chicago i mean really yeah, no i've seen several of the videos i've not been willing to share them even though they sound good, if this was Chicago or even, uh, you know, California Transit Authority, you know, with J Danny, I, I would, would, you know, be right there. But, uh, uh, you know, once I'm connected to a band, then I, I, I want to, I, I know there will be copycats and hanger on. And then, and I have no negative about that other than I'm here to promote, as you well know, the original versions of I the songs. That. I understand and, uh, well, I, speaking of the Tonight Show, I uh, when I was working for NBC and I was going to be in NBC, um, I was going to be in Los Angeles for one of the NBC meetings, and uh, you know they paid for the hotel and the meals and everything. But uh, I was able to buy uh, two seats to the Tonight Show, and my mom had come back from Hawaii and she was uh, there in LA, and so I took my mom to the Tonight Show, and uh, I just remember Marsha Mason was the main guest with Johnny that night. But, but sitting in, and, the, and the, they taped the show like at two o'clock in the afternoon. Right, right. You know, we're standing out in the heat and whatever. But, uh, but yeah, the, the going to those kinds of things and seeing them real uh, is surreal uh, is. To, to be able to, to, to go to those kind of tapings. But uh, I don't know, um, there's a lot of, lot of, music has led us on different paths and yet I wouldn't have gone down a different path had I had the opportunity to choose it. Right. Um, and I think that's why I keep making the shows. Um, and I, I had two more stations. I don't know who you are, but I want to run your stuff. Can you give me the username and password and put me on your Sunday morning mailing list? So, you know, the two new stations this week that are out there, I'm sure there are some that have dropped off. Um, when they start to bounce multiple times, then I sometimes delete them. But, you know, uh, it's just a copy and paste, you know, when it comes to distribution of this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I remember yesterday thinking, well, let's see, I've got to up upload the show Sunday. I wonder if I, they got, I, and I went ahead and took 20 minutes yesterday. The shows are done. They're already labeled. The PDFs I have to make every week. But I, I, I'd already, I do a, I do a, a 13 week spreadsheet. I mean, I know what I'm doing. Um, and that, and I will sometimes, you know, somebody will die and I'll substitute another one in, but I, um, I, I enjoy it. And, and the nice thing about having so many shows is that I don't feel like even if someone is just a diehard listener to your station and they listen to it 24 seven and they know all the shows and who Kurt David is and all that, they still couldn't tell you what I played six months ago, much less a year or two years ago. Right, right, right. Um, so I, I, I feel good about rotating them and keeping them fresh. Beautiful. Um, and, and, and again, I, I, I'm hoping 
my friend in Hong Kong, I thought about this the other day, he has backed up and, and has a library of every show I've ever made. And I wanted to Good. write up some kind of legal thing. Um, and, and in fact, he has the FTP information. If I get hit by a car, I don't want this to stop. I want him to, that way to go. You know, just change the username and password and he is your contact instead of me and, and, right. and, and let's keep going another 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, I know and, the feeling, I know the feeling with that because I'm, I don't know if you remember, but I, I don't know if you probably don't, I used to do a show called the weekend, all these feature show, which kind of gave the people an idea of what the weekend was going to be like as far as music, 60s, 70s, and a little bit of right. 80s to an extent. But that show was dedicated to a lot of oldies artists and a lot of newer uh, music artists or, or independent artists that were actually mm -hmm. from the bands, but were independent right. people. And a lot of people didn't know who they were. So I was kind of introducing that. But that mm -hmm. made like four or five different shows. My girls were growing up. And then I said, you know what? Three hours? There's a lot of produ production time, a lot of editing yeah. time, then sending mm -hmm. them out to everybody. And then, you know, people coming back and saying, oh, well, I didn't get it. Can you resend it again? I'm out with my family. I mean, right. I mean, I, look, I get the idea of FTP. I mm -hmm. tried it for a while, but sometimes the FTP doesn't work. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because of the port. I don't know if it's because of the, the information or, or, or mm. something gets screwed up. And even when you try to download shows, you can't download them. It happened to me many times when I try to send the people. So mm. it depends on, on, number one, if your show's getting to the people it needs to get to. What I recently, I'll tell you what I recently did with a friend. A friend of mine is Frank uh, Glass. He does Frank Todd's top 20. He's a great guy, oldies mm -hmm. guy. Um, but I told him, I said, Frank, listen, overnight, I have nothing. I have nothing overnight. I have, I play a lot of oldies songs and stuff like that. So yeah. why don't I just play you from two o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. to 10 o'clock in the morning, eight hours, mm -hmm. eight hours. You just do whatever you want, promote whatever you want. And he says, my God, after you did that, I got hit by all people for advertising because what it does for you guys it shows the people that number one, and it became the number one listening radio show on my station, which right. helped propel him to more advertisers. So now uh -huh. he's got advertisers squeaking at his door and he's got radio stations like, listen, every radio station tries to outdo one another, you uh -huh. know? And I look at it like, okay, this friendly competition. I, I don't care if the other radio station wants to play him 10 hours, I'll still play him eight hours. Um, but I'm the original one that took that chance. See, I look at it like this. The less programming I have to do, and yeah. the, 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 the music that I'm going to listen to anyway is there, I'll do it. Ironically, a lot of people have said, why, Kurt, haven't you started your own radio station? Um, a lot of work. And it is a lot of work, but I will suggest this, that the FTP password and username that I have to upload to shows mm -hmm. And, and then I have a different username and password that I give out to you and the people who play mm -hmm. back the shows. And as I do on Sundays, I just send you an email. It's a blanket email. It goes to 80 or 90 people. Uh, it's all in a, a you know, a, a copy and paste into the address thing. Right. I do it one, one time and, and, and you all already have my username and password. So it's up to you to access the shows originally um, I did it on Sundays thinking that that way people wouldn't even mess with it till Monday or Tuesday. Right. And most, most everybody was running it on the weekends. Well, now all of a sudden people are like, Oh no, I run it Sunday afternoon or I yes. run it Monday morning. And I'm like, but the nice thing about it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the only problem I've ever had is, is like when I travel, if I was going to be gone on a Sunday. And so I've uploaded on Fridays. I left the shows for this week. But next to it is a, is a folder that's got the broadcast week. You click on that folder and there's all the shows. So, you know, once you all get there, so you may, you may be able to simplify your distribution. Um, I would love to. I would love to. Stuff. See, because what I want to do, what I want to do, Kurt, with you mm -hmm. is I want to take your show and put it where Frank's is in between. So this way, somebody's leading up. In other words, yeah. you can lead up to his show. And then you can follow his show. So this way you're in between or he's in between you. Mm -hmm. And since most people listen to him, they're going to listen before the show. 
and they're going to listen after the show because they're not going to know when the show's done unless you make it a, a program announcer. This is Kurt David taking you back right here, you know, on, on Hamilton Radio. Then mm -hmm. you'll know that now your show begins. And that's kind of where I want to go. I want to actually create another uh, channel just right. for, for the oldies guys. I, I really well, that, I've been wanting to do that for years. And I could do that basically by the cloud. I don't even have to worry about um, programming the music. I just program the cloud. The cloud does it all. I'm doing it right now huh. for a station called Smoking Bacon. They're a app. And then they created a website. And now he can create his own advertising. Now he can create this. Now for, for uh, $200 a month, I am now bringing an income from just creating a radio station that's on the cloud. And all I have to do is go in there every now and then, change mm -hmm. sleepers, change advertisements, um, and, and change music. And rotate wow. music and put them on different uh, clocks mm -hmm. and, and different things. And that's, this is the easiest way <laughs> to make money. I've never right. made two hundred dollars so fast, you know. Right. And because of the COVID thing, right. I told him. I already told the man. I said because he's a pro military and he's got a lot of military people that listen, which is great. Yeah. And I said, listen. I said, if you decide you don't want the radio station, let me know. I will keep it going. And you know, either you can come back or you know, you could say, you know, I don't want to do it anymore. So, the past five or six months, I've been paying for it. So mm. I just reached out to him. I said, do you want to still keep it? He said, absolutely. He says, now we're doing better. I'll send you a check, you know, by the end of the month. And I'm like, beautiful. Sure, sure. You know? sure. So, so there's, there's ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. occur. There's ways to make money in this industry. Right. It doesn't have to be what you think it's going to be. You don't have to have a computer running. You don't, mm -hmm. and, and I try to tell people this all the time. Don't, don't wait. Don't wait to see other people do it. Just do it yourself. And I, I've got like 10 or, 10 or 12 other radio stations interested since I'm doing it for smoking bacon because he sees a success. Once you have success with one, then you right. have another success with somebody else. And then it starts growing. You become a not monopoly. Um, is it, is it, is your broadcast stations, I'm sorry, your, your yeah. feed, is it pure internet or are there some AM or FMs involved? Well, here's the thing. My, my feed, since it's been around since 1996-97, right. um, I didn't want to change the feed. And I'll explain to you why. If you change the IP address feed, you lose all the people when the server changes. Oh, and okay. Okay. and that's okay. happened to so many of my friends in radio. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm talking about strictly internet. But at the same time, what happens to that is if you can keep that IP address and have a relay go into that IP address, you never mm -hmm. lose anybody. And the key mm -hmm. to a radio station is, is gain as many listeners as you can. But with some of the, um, some of the royalty rights, right. you lose a lot because the total listening hours is what creates your, the, the, uh, the money you have to pay. So right. to have more listeners is actually going against what a business is supposed to be. Yeah. You know, a business you're supposed to grow and it's supposed to grow, you know, and mm -hmm. bigger and bigger and bigger. But internet radio, no, they want you to grow slowly, but mm -hmm. growing slowly, you have to pay more for it. So my idea around that was to as many uh, options to mm -hmm. how to listen to your station. That only makes you look bigger right. and, and having people like you on and Tris and, I mean, Eddie Money and other people that we've had on in the past. I just talked to Billy Gibbons from uh, ZZ Top. Yes, no, like and a lot of these people, they, they are just clamoring for people to interview them. They're just, right. they can't wait to be interviewed. They can't wait to talk mm -hmm. about stuff. And here's the thing about internet. You know, if you go on CBS or any other radio station, Sirius Radio, everything's rigidly timed. Internet mm -hmm. If you have somebody who wants to ask questions, if you have somebody that wants to stay a little bit longer, there's no problem. You allow the time for that. And, mm -hmm. and you just move on after that. There's no set time. Even though there should be, there's no set time, which kind of gives you that flexibility that regular radio doesn't have. But mm -hmm. you said AM, FM radio stations. Yes, we are on a couple FM radio stations with certain shows. 
We mm-hmm. were on iHeartRadio with my daughter's show, DJ Danny Show. She's got mm-hmm. people from Broadway, uh, Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, and you know, and she's just a, a young kid, 23 years old. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and she cut her teeth, you know, the same way you did or at the radio station, yeah. the studio, you right. know, being shows and then meeting people and, you know, going to these uh, 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 big comic cons and, and horror cons or whatever. I meet these people and say, hey, would you like to be on a radio show? Oh, sure, I'd love to be on a radio show. Who, do you have, who have you had? What have you done? You know, mm-hmm. and it's all about credibility. You know, the longer you've been in the business, as you know, and I know, 24 years speaks a lot to people. Is it, well, wait, if that person's been there that long, they got to be credible. You know, Mm -hmm. when I talked to Bobby Figueroa from uh, from the Beach Boys, the drummer from the Beach Boys, he said, the first thing I did was check you out. And he said, yes, you are the real deal. You've been around that long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get a lot of that. But there's so many ways today to make money. And this is the one way I found we're going to make a lot of money. And we're also investing in 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 an independent film company because we are a film company too. We're called Iron Horse Films. We have our own website eventually going to be released very soon. That's going to be for mm-hmm. independent films because there's over 30,000 independent filmmakers that don't get any films released at these uh, film festivals. Now, because right. of COVID, nothing. Right, right. So that's a niche we're tapping into. Well, and this is the other thing that I wanted to make you aware of. Sure. Obviously, any way that you can help me promote the TYB or SS shows sure. on stations. Um, and again, not knowing the people that I give the username and password to could be operating an internet station or a broadcast station. Correct. But the commercials that I might want to put in there would fly on the broadcast stations, but wouldn't necessarily be legal on an internet station. You know, it's it's a can of worms. It's a double-edged sword, yeah, it is. And then that's why I don't even mess with the commercials. Now, again, I have local clients and the two or three radio stations, broadcast stations back in Kentucky, where I lived for 43 years and was a known entity uh, back in the uh, 70s and then part of the 80s and 80, summer of 88, I went back on the radio and then Again, uh, around uh, sometime in the 90s, then the Taking You Back show started airing. So um, I am interested in trying to figure out how to monetize TYB and SS. Mm -hmm. So I'm open for any um, ideas and thoughts you have on that. Most of the internet people that I'm connected with, whatever license they have does not include their ability to play commercials and it would have to be like a Wrigley's gum or GM or something that was a mass appeal in order to give it to 40 or 60 radio stations that are literally all around the world. Correct. I mean, Correct. I don't know what to do with it. the guy in Hong Kong and the two guys down in Australia and the guy in England and the guy in France, but they love playing the shows. Um, they are internet stations. As far as I know, they don't insert commercials and they're like me, um, they just funnel the, uh, the, the fees and pay what, I don't pay the royalties for because I don't broadcast the shows. Um, the radio stations do and you all pay the internet. Yes, fee. we do. Yes, we do. And, and, and that's fine. If it's a blanket fee and you can write it off or have an underwriter or your, you know, that's where your savings from retirement or working is, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't really wear, care where it comes from you're the one who'll get in trouble with the internet police, not me. Um, Right. And let me know if you ever run into one of those internet police, because I've never run into one in 15 years, but they they are pretty lenient. I get phone calls every now and then that they check Mm -hmm. on me from ASCAP. Right. And uh, you know, sound exchange. That's, you know, that's fine. I, I, I tell them, listen, you got any problems? I'm on live 365. Just contact. Okay. And okay. Life 65 is supposed to pay all them things. I just got a phone call not recently from a place in Canada saying that, well, you know, you're, you're uh, being played in Canada. I said, well, I got it. Ex- you know, it's, it's restricted from Canada. I don't have it played in Canada. Um, and they said, oh, well, well, you know, you better tell the, you know, Life 65. So I contacted them and they took care of it right away. I said, write up a letter, send it to this guy and we're done. Right. You know? 
yeah. it wasn't my fault. So they took the fall for it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that happens as a radio station. That's the kind of, you know, the stuff you have to learn. You right, know, when you're right. doing this. And if you don't understand it, I'm sorry, it, it, it's very confusing. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's the guidelines. I yeah. mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're supposed to play three songs within uh, an artist, uh, maybe mm -hmm. two songs within an artist for an hour. Right. You know, main media doesn't have to do that. They can play whatever they want, pretty much, even though they won't do that. Right. Um, you know, sometimes it, it's really hard to do. But I was talking to a couple people and I said, you know what? For 24 years, you've been legal. For 24 years, you've been obeying everything you said. We're not going to worry too much if you play, you know, three or four songs from an artist because you haven't done it forever. So right. it, it can slip through. He said, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried right. about the people that do it constantly. Me too. Constantly. So yeah. that, that's, what, that's what I've learned. If you can do it in a way that's not going to signify you and rule you and rule you as a person that's doing it all the time, you're allowed to get away with little slip ups here. Sometimes well, once, software does. It. Once I learned about those two different sets of rules, I realized that I could limit to three artists in an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if I'm if I'm going to do a British invasion. Okay, there's only going to be three stones or three beetles in there. And I know the, the rules that the, the tightest part of the rule, I will stay within that tightest part. And the people who don't have the rules, it, as long as I'm entertaining them, as long as they like the music, they yeah. like the knowledge that I'm sharing with them, then they're not keeping track of that stuff. But there is a, a, a pencil pusher out there that if I played nine Beatles songs in a row, eventually someone would come after my butt. Right. So I, I I, you know, I, I, now again, fine line. it's a fine I, line you're going to walk. You can, well, you can put I, my I, friends said you can put medley or you can put, um, there's a lot of different ways you can put it. Now with your okay. show, it's different because you don't have to really, I mean, you do have to say what you're right, what you're putting in, but you can put medley and just have like a whole bunch of Beatles songs in there. Huh? Well, at this point in time, I'm trying to create primarily for broadcast, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't have as many rules and if i can make it work for broadcast then it covers uh, then i make sure that i don't do more than the three artists from from the same uh, songs from the same artist within an hour um and again again i i if i if when someone dies then i will make a one or two hour show for them but it only goes on my broadcast stations or I will put it out there in my specials folder and say, if you legally can air this, I did just finish this tribute to share or tribute to whoever. I know I just did one recently. I don't remember who it was, but uh, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to offer my work and give it to you, give it to everybody and whoever legally can play it should play it, but everybody who shouldn't play it, I'm not the one who made that decision, so I'm not legally hung out. Um, if they do choose to air it, they and they, they're the one. You're the one who aired it, so you're the one they're coming after. And that's the way um, it should be. And, and 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 I'm just playing by the rules as they were given to me 15, 20 years ago. And I'm hoping one day where they will change, or I, I will be honest with you. If Dick Clark's company called or Casey Kasem's company called, the first thing they'd say is get your butt off the internet. Right, exactly. Totally. You know, and I want to tell you too about Casey Casey. I have a guy, as a good friend of mine, his name is Steve Jarrett. He's a good friend of mine. He runs a, another internet radio station. He does exactly the same sound that Casey can do. I mean, as far as the sound, it sounds just like Casey Kasem. He's you say incredible. Steve, Steve, Steve Jarrett? Steve Jarrett. He's yeah, a friend of mine. Okay. And I think, I, I think I've talked to him or I know him. I don't know that he runs my shows, but the name really rings a loud bell. Yeah, he's a he's a great guy. He, he's been my friend probably. He runs a, a show a, a station called Q Star FM, and okay. uh, he's been. Where, 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 where's it located? Florida, Florida. Oh, okay, okay. Well, send me his contact information if you. I think would love he to. Might, he's a great. Think listen, if he he's might, a, might want to run taking you back. He's a great guy, but the, the the reason why I'm telling you is because if they need somebody to do Casey Kasem. He sounds just like him. Oh, okay, yeah. And, no, you know they yeah. can. You they can actually do. Here's what the thing they can do with that. 
They could take Casey Kasem after he passed away and use Steve. I don't think Steve would mind either because it's it's a it's a big it's a big presentation for him to do that and even something yeah. that he'd probably love to do. But take his voice, you know, and and mm -hmm. create new shows right. with him as Casey Kasem. Well, this is the stupid thing in my mind is Just if I can give if I can give them three hundred shows from someone who was there when Casey and Dick were DJing mm -hmm. and I'm still alive and I have such a large library of shows, I don't have to be Dick or Casey. And again, they were doing countdowns, nothing wrong with countdowns. Right. 50, 50 years ago when they both started, that was the, the normal. Um, I chose more for, the local radio station and if i got an idea i wanted to run with that idea that's where i came up with the thematic why every show is 70s soul classics or 80s ladies or british I invasion that. i love that and and yeah. well to me that didn't close any doors didn't bring any shutters in it left me whichever direction i wanted to go i stayed in within my own genre which was thematic and um, see, some people say, well, why don't you do a countdown show? The last thing I want to do in my life is a <laughs> countdown show. Um, but I do think the audience here in Vegas and other places around the world that play Casey Kasem for three hours would be just as good to have a two hour taking you back or songwriter Absolutely. search. Um, to me, uh, from what I've been told by 500 people, you know, what you do is just as good, if not better. It's different. It's unique. So this is why I moved to Vegas to raise <laughs> my visibility and to then pitch, again, uh, this contact at Dick Clark, who obviously they shut the doors and told everybody to stay home. My package is sitting on somebody's desk. It might even be sitting on Larry's desk. Um, and I have no idea when they're coming back, if they're coming back. But I, I am a religious guy in the sense that this is all in the Lord's hands. And yep. when he's ready for it to happen, whether it's when I'm dead and you and Steve and these other people um, somehow have a way to uh, share, okay, how many Kurt Engelhart taking your backs do you have? You know, who's got a, can, can we patch it all together and create a library and, and go to Casey Kasem's people and say, you know, here's Kurt's family's name and his contacts, but if you can get them to give us permission, we've got copies of his shows, we would help you build a library. And I'll help um, you in any way I can, you know? I, I don't well, yeah, I, that's where I'm thinking my friend in Hong Kong, who I already know keeps everything, and my friend in, in Australia and another one in England, um, I need to write some kind of letter that I can send to them um, and give it to my, my two daughters. So if, if something ever did happen, that there would be some legal right um, for them on behalf of my family, uh, to, yourself included, to uh, try to make that connection. Sure, um, sure. To where that, you know, and if it was $500 a month, you know, it would be great for my grandkids to have. You know, it would pay part of my rent here in my condo. Well, that's all good and fine. If it happens, fine. If not, I worked like the rest of the world and, and drew, you I'm drawing. You deserve it, Kurt. You really I, well, I'm, dra I'm drawing my social security and I work for this college, <laughs> this college in Kentucky, Murray State University. Um, uh, Jean Morant, who plays for the Memphis Grizzlies, was a, a freshman star. Uh, at Murray State, and that's how we got to the NBA. And uh, but uh, but I worked for Murray State for five years, and I'm drawing money from them every month. Um, I, I worked for the TV station uh, for ten years, um, but they just wrote me a big check when I left, and I just had a big time. I never even thought about sticking that in a drawer or putting that into a simple savings account. And thirty years later, I you know, I could be living in a nicer condo, but. You know, money is not what drives me. Um, the, the, the creative <laughs> juices that make me want to go in and make another show. Um, and uh, the beauty of what I was talking about earlier and just want to make this real clear. The easiest distribution to me is you just send me your email address. 
and I give you, send you an FTP information. And then I just, I mean, Sunday morning, I will put that, you know, blanket email out and everybody gets it. And I haven't done more than two minutes worth of work because I've already done the shows. Makes it, and easier. Yeah, them it out makes it easier, right? I get what you're saying. And, and to me, that, uh, that's the simpler you can do the distribution, then, then that becomes the less headache so you can spend more time on the creative side. And, and uh, you know, or, or going out and pitching, uh, pitching stuff. Well, uh, you know. I got tons of friends that have radio stations over the years. Uh, okay. many, many, many of them um, would definitely probably love to run your show. And I, and believe me, I'm not the kind of person that likes to hide things or, or say, Oh, this is my show. And then I know yeah. I want I yeah. want to help, you know, promote. And I, I look at radio stations as not competition. Right. And the reason why is because not everybody plays the same thing. Nobody plays the same genre and nobody plays the same music. Mm -hmm. Nobody plays the same mm -hmm. years or decades or whatever you want to say. And right. everybody's station is different in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have an app. We have the radio station links. We have, we're on uh, Roku. We're on um, TuneIn Radio. We're on, um, now we're on Google Play. Uh, no, Google Play. Um, Google Voice Command, uh, Apple Voice Command, and a bunch of others. So I just put us on all there for them. And it's, again, it's not for me. It's for my <laughs> listeners to find other options to listen to you. And right. artists. So when I say I'm not looking for competition, I'm not. I, I feel in a way that we're all not comp uh, competitors. We're all oh, yeah. trying to do the same thing. And at the same time, we're all trying to make a buck here and there so we can keep mm -hmm. going and make more. Because right. the, the worst thing I want to happen is all the radio stations to just die and all you got is FM and AM. And not that there's anything wrong with that, right. but, but when you have corporations controlling everything, mm -hmm. now your show goes away, this show goes away. That goes away. And I don't want to see that. I want to see everybody prosper, but I want to see everybody prosper for the reason that it's not under control of one person. It's under mm -hmm. control of people that want your music and people want your, your, your show. And, and, you know, again, your show is, is unlike a lot of others where some people will tell you stories. Some people just read their names and read the artists. Like when mm -hmm. I did the show called Crystal Cavern today in the UK, Mm -hmm. I, I put my emphasis on the artists that send me their, their songs and give me that little information about what the song meant to them right. and, and why that song, like from Pepe Castro, was so important when Pepe Castro was the one from the uh, uh, Blues, Blues Magoos. Um, mm -hmm. And he was, he was uh, friends with Richie Havens, and Richie Havens gave him the reason to carry on. So mm -hmm. that song's significant for uh, Pepe Castro. So by not reading that or reading that, I am showing you what the, the show is about, but I'm also giving my feelings and my, um, right. my idea of the way the radio show should be. And that's mm -hmm. why we, we created it like nine or 10 years ago or even longer than that. And it's still running today. And we've got more and more people, we even got uh, people like, um, what's his name? Steve uh, from, um, from Blood, Sweat and Tears. Um, mm -hmm. He did Megan's Gypsy Eyes. I can't think of his last name, but um, his name is Steve. Um, yeah. But anyway, David Clayton Thomas as well. But, you know, mm -hmm. the thing is, these artists, they need us. They have nobody else. Right, right, they right. They have right. the local venues, which, you know, if you're local, great. Um, but when you're on YouTube, you're just another thing on YouTube. And, yeah, you yeah. know, people look at a cat running around a circle, three million views. <laughs> you know, three million right. views for a cat running around a circle or, or doing funny things. Right. But then this local artist that's a good music artist and plays great music and was from a band from, you know, from the 60s, say like, you know, from the Moody Blues. I mean, nobody knows who it is and it doesn't even get seen unless it's right. in a club, unless you're in a group, unless right. you're, you know, unless you're, you're privy to it. So, a lot of the a lot of the reasons why we do what we do mm -hmm. is is not only to entertain the people, but be, but because we love the artists and the music so much, we want to share it with everybody. Well, and that that is okay. So if I met Mac Davis and I had a conversation with him, and then there was a uh, a uh, TV taping 
that I would find out about there in Nashville called Legends and Lyrics. Right. Well, okay, Mac was one of those artists, and I and it was so crazy because it was a meet and line, a little meet and greet thing, and I'd mm-hmm. pay extra to do it. And I said, "Well, Mac, we we met uh, when you came to Moore." He said, "Kurt, it's so good to see you again." <laughs> well. It's got to be a line that when anybody, as you're an artist, comes up and says, we met so-and-so, you just automatically say, oh, well, it's great to see you again. You know, how you been doing, you know, and, and, uh, but, but, you know, and we both laughed because I knew what he was doing and he knew I knew, but it was, he was still being cordial and he was nice. And we took a few minutes and we talked about a few other things. So it was what it is. And when you are the DJ and you are the music man and they know, you know what you're doing and you would probably help them more than they could have ever dreamed just because you were one of them. And who plays, and if you don't play this song, you need to play this song. Whoever finds this, I love you by Mac Davis. And it was the very first song he had out on the radio. Okay. And it, it was probably one of those, you know, top 20, top 30 songs that got played. But whoever finds this, I love you. Oh, I heard, and, I think I heard of that. Yeah. Well, it's like this little kid who was in an orphanage wrote a note and left it by the, the fence. And this old man found it and they became friends and, um, you know, then one day the, the boy went out there and the little man was not there and he went back to his, his uh, uh, room and got out his Crayola and his piece of paper and wrote, whoever finds this, I love you. And, and that was Mac Davis's first quasi radio hit. Um, and, you know, to me, the ideas that these people have come up with songs and and he lives in memphis bobby goldsboro lives down the street i mean these people are all interconnected yeah Um, and this legends and lyrics thing was one of the best things i ever went to um and and uh uh, you know i mean you're sitting 20 feet from and they're taping it they're they're, they're, there you can go to legendsandlyrics.com and they still have some of the shows up there. They're still selling, I think, the CDs, or I think I bought it, the DVD at the time. But uh, um, And I'm in one of the shots on one of the uh, – Kenny Loggins did there, and I'm singing along with him, and the camera cut around, cut away to me, and I sing the next verse with him, and then they cut back to you know. So I'm, I'm on the DVD, that's but, awesome. uh, that's but awesome. that was the, through um, – and I became friends with the Loggins and Messina – uh, people there in um, Massachusetts that do a lot of their stuff. So, um, and I happened to be having a conversation with the girl. We talked every couple of weeks and I said, well, I said, there's this new venue that opened up here in Kentucky. And I said, I noticed that uh, Kenny and Jim are doing this uh, Loggins and Messina rides again tour. And I said, I noticed on the website that they're playing in Ohio, like on Wednesday night and they're playing in Nashville on Sunday afternoon. I said, we're right between those two places. Why don't you contact this Carson Center and see if you can book them in there for that Friday or Saturday? Sure enough, it happened. She said, Kurt, I can't thank you enough. This was, you know, we look for these kind of places. Um, You know, we're going to be here and we're going here. What's in between? And, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't a huge turnout. Loggins and Messina isn't a, 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 you know, they had a couple of hits. Kenny Loggins is known more, and he did do a certain number of his solo things. Sure. Um, but uh, but it was, you know, I, I've had, you know, uh, and the problem I ran in is I worked for this university and I did nights. And and because we are, or Kentucky, Paducah is three hours from Nashville, about four hours from Memphis. You could go six hours up to, to Louisville. Um, but uh, they would play... Um, Wednesday, I'm sorry, Thursday nights, they would play there in Paducah because then they, on Friday, they could travel to Nashville and be set up to play Saturday. Um, and so this was, this, this was a feeder place. Um, and, 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 but they did, I helped them get a number of gigs in there on Thursday nights and then I couldn't go. Um, wow. So anyway, all right, well, I'm going to send you the FTP stuff and Please. I'm going to let you go. Kurt, and uh, one, more, one more thing, Kurt, before we yes, go, yes, just, yes. um, if you can, 
if you can, if you, that's fine if you can't. Uh, just give me a sweeper. Uh, say, you know, the, you're, you're Kurt David for taking well, it back and you're listening you to the radio. You just type it up so I have the details in front of me. Um, and in fact, a lot of people just give me their station name. Okay. And then I, I have some liners that I cut. But if you've got a specific liner you want me to cut, just just type it no, up and no, email no, it to me. It's basically just promoting you. So when I play your Well, but I, I mean the details on the station or what time it's on or uh, 95.9 on the FM dial or, or at, at, you know, gocanada.com and what whatever whatever is the – we okay. want to tie it's this fine. back so that people can go to your website and I can mention that at the same time. Or if you know it's going to be on Sunday at 6 o'clock, you know, central time or, I mean, whatever details you want to provide to me, I'll be glad to cut it. Um, and uh, I just cut it all voice and email it back as a, as a uh, high quality MP3. Um, and then you can, you know, splice it up or, or okay. patch them together and add any music or beds. So yeah, I usually do that when I add stations or I offer it. Some of them take me up on it. A lot of times I just had three or four basic liners and I would just go in when I pick up three or four stations, I'd just go cut those lines uh, for each station, but change the, the tag at the end and send sure. them out to them. Okay. And then eventually I would eventually hear them some on the stations. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That's the easy, easy thing for me to do. So you send me, I just saw the email there. So anyway, I'm going to go eat some supper. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, what a pleasure will, it was talking to you. Well, yeah, yeah. No, like I said, and and I will voice this more on the email, but um, figuring out a way to monetize either, let's say, outside internet stations or even in internet stations is still something I'm trying to figure out a, a better method for me to do. So any ideas that you have or even co-ideas that you can assist me and we, we, you know, there's enough money, we do some splitting. Uh, I, I'm open to those avenues. I'm thinking, now, Kurt, I'm basically thinking, like you said, have your own oldies radio station, Kurt, take, Kurt David taking you back, just like you said. That, well, you know, yeah. and, put and, everything and on again, the cloud and then, you know, you've got your music there. You, you want, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to play the 60s, say I want to do 1960 for Monday. Um, and you, you, yeah. you can change it up whenever you want, or you well, can give, tell me, give me I'll the, run it for you. I'll be glad yeah. to run it for you. Well, give me the details on the, 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 uh, the cost because the, um, I can tell you right this, now, it's going to be $59 a month for me. So anything you want to pay me over, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just glad to get your station out there. for Well, you. give me the logistics as to how it works and where and give me some examples that I can go listen to sure, uh, sure. and then I'd be glad to to uh, further that idea and and uh, maybe start with some of the, the taking you backs or uh, uh, and whether we, we do a step we can definitely we do, well, do well I was thinking of even a separate channel for the songwriter searches or you know be awesome. the, the, these these days we do taking you back and then uh, when it's let's say it's a, a 48 minute show that was the whole purpose of the tank uh, the songwriter searches was right. to fill that 12 minutes or right. eight of right. those eight of those 12 minutes right. so there'd be right. a commercial after then songwriter search is played and then it gets us up to the top of the hour and we start the next hour of taking you back that's mm -hmm. where the songwriter searches came to be and then i had so many of them i realized that i could put them together as a group and then play four weeks of taking you back and that next week here's the songwriter searches edited together in a 48 minute and here's two hours of that so um that's a that's a whole nother um way a product oh i got low battery here okay so. yeah we've been talking a long time i'll be All talking right. to you what a what a pleasure it was talking to you you, you got a lot of great memories and uh, and thanks for, for giving us a lot of information about you. And I'm sure my listeners will be really, really thrilled to uh, listen to your show again and also hear, you know, uh, the man behind the curtain, you know? <laughs> there you go. Take there care, my go. friend. He's, Have a good he's, one. He's hiding in Vegas. All right. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.